The general election that was held on the 14th of December 1918 was unusual in a number of ways. Not only was it very close to Christmas, but it was the very first election in which there was universal male suffrage and for the first time some women could vote. The Representation of the People Act, which passed on the 6th of February 1918, enfranchised about 8 million women in Britain. But about 7 million women still did not have the vote. Whilst men could vote at 21, women had to wait until they were 30 before they could vote, and about 5 million women in Britain were still too young to vote in the 1918 election. Additionally, there were about 2 million women who were over 30 but did not meet the property qualifications in the 1918 Act. Politicians looked towards the 1918 election with a great deal of anxiety. There was the new working class male voter and the woman voter. How would they vote? Who would they vote for? What things would they be concerned about? But more importantly, would they actually bother to vote? Only 57% of eligible voters actually voted, the lowest turnout in any modern election. So why did so few women choose to vote? It could be that the complexities of the female franchise meant that some women just didn't understand whether or not they were eligible to vote. Other factors which are often attributed to the low turnout are a very low service vote and the fact that many seats, although interestingly non in Birmingham, went uncontested. In other areas, it was a sense that maybe it didn't make any difference what they voted. And in some, maybe it just was that whatever was said or yelled or talked about by those who supported women's suffrage, many women not only were not interested, but actually didn't want the vote. The idea of the women voter caused a sense of fascination for many. Politicians seemed to be falling over themselves to claim that they'd always supported women's franchise, whatever party they'd been in and whatever their behaviour had been prior to the war. Political parties developed a number of strategies to appeal to the new woman voter. For example, the Labour Party argued that they would extend the franchise for women to be equal to that of men. The coalition government, led by Lloyd George, used the slogan, Homes Fit for Heroes, to appeal to women. After all, they argued, it was women who were concerned most about the home. And indeed, in the pre-war era, women had said they needed the vote in order to improve the state of their homes. Women's reaction to being able to vote for the very first time seems to have been varied. In some parts of the country, the local papers describe how the women beamed and smiled at everybody as they entered the polling booths. Their smile and their happiness was infectious, and even the returning officers smiled along with the policemen as the women cast their vote for the very first time. One of the most obvious ways that political parties could appeal to the woman voter was to have a woman candidate. However, in the 700 plus seats that were contested in the 1918 election, only 17 had women candidates. Strangely enough, three of these were in the West Midlands and around the Birmingham area. In the West Midlands, as elsewhere in the country, the women candidates were very diverse. There was a trade unionist, a militant suffragette and a law-abiding suffragist, and they all stood for three different political parties. In Stourbridge, Mary MacArthur stood as the Labour Party's candidate. She was well known in the area because of her role in leading the Cradley Heath Women Chainmakers Strike of 1910. She was a committed pacifist and once said that she would rather lose by a thousand votes than support any policy which might cause a future war. She was well known in the area, but only as Mary MacArthur. An election official forced her to use her married name and so she appeared on ballot papers as Mrs William Anderson, whom many voters might not have recognised. Mary would probably have stood again, and probably in Stourbridge as well, but sadly she died on the 1st of January 1921 of cancer. In Smithwick, one of the most well-known women candidates stood, Christabel Pankhurst, the militant suffragette. Along with her mother Emmeline, she had run the Women's Social and Political Union before the war. But after women were given the vote, they set up the Women's Party, a political party for the new woman voter. In the election, she only allowed women to campaign for her. 
Her platform was aggressively patriotic, but also strongly feminist, and she supported policies like communal housing, which would free women from the drudgery of housework and childcare. But these views did not appeal to the electorate in Smethwick, and she was defeated, although narrowly. The least well-known of all these women candidates was the law-abiding suffragist Marjorie Corbett Ashby. She took on the Chamberlain political machine, standing in Birmingham Ladywood against future Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain. She attracted some criticism because she was standing for the Liberal Party and supported former Prime Minister Herbert Asquith, who had been violently anti-suffrage. She stood for improved housing for returning servicemen and an end to all wars, which was possibly influenced by the fact that her husband was a captain in the army and still in Belgium whilst the election was ongoing. The only woman to be elected in 1918 had not taken part in any of the campaigns because she was, at the time, in Holloway Prison. Constance Markovich, a supporter of Irish nationalism, visited the House of Commons on her release the following year. There she saw her name on a peg in the cloakroom. It was a symbol of women's empowerment and entry into political life. 1918 was the beginning of a change in women's role in public life. The following year, the Sex Disqualification Removal Act enabled women to become JPs, to become barristers, lawyers, and take a new role in public life. And in 1928, women got the franchise on equal terms with men at the age of 21. Since that all-important first election in 1918, the question has to be asked, how much has having the vote really lived up to the hopes and dreams of the suffrage campaigners in the pre-war eras? On the road to equality that began with that 1918 election, women have come a long way, but there is still a way to go.